Any questions about anything you read in the book or about anything else? Sierra? Page 67. Okay. Um, it's like the third paragraph that's under God and the Heavenly Council. Okay. Um, it says, let us make, and he said that um, God is speaking to the Heavenly Council. Who, uh, who consists of the Heavenly Council? Who all is in that? Well, the Heavenly Council was thought to be uh, the angels. But actually, when God said, let us make man in our own image, this is not the evangelical interpretation. The evangelical interpretation of that is that when God said, let us make man in our own image, that's an indication of the Trinity. Because the angels... Are not, we are not made in the image of the angels. We are made in the image of God. When God, that's one of the first places, well actually in Genesis 1, when it says, uh, and God said, you have the Father. And God, when God said, he spoke the word. And John 1 tells us that the word is the Son. Okay, that's, that's another name for Jesus, the incarnate Son, who was present with the Father from all eternity. And then it says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Genesis 1. So all three of the Trinity are really introduced in Genesis 1. But this place where he says, um, let us make man in our own image, God is himself as a Trinity, a community. You know, God can legitimately speak in the plural. He is one God, not three gods. He is one God with three persons. I struggled for years. There's all sorts of analogies for that. Well, an egg was one of my favorites. You know, an egg, one egg has three distinct parts. There's an egg, a shell, a, a, a white, a shell, and a yolk, right? It's all still one egg. But still, all analogies break down. I finally woke up one day and went, duh, the perfect analogy for God is the creature that was made in God's image. As a human being, I have a mind, I have a spirit or soul. Some people differentiate between spirit or soul, but for the sake of discussion, I have, a, I have a spirit or soul, and I have a body. Three very distinct parts of me. My mind can stop working, and my body will still function. Okay? My body um, can stop functioning, and my mind can still be active. So there's three parts of me that, to some extent, operate independently, and yet, and yet I'm one being. In the same way, to me, that's the best analogy for how God can be one God, and yet be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? And so here, I believe God is saying, let us, he's speaking to himself, the Trinity, because we are made in the image of God. And one of the ways I think we're made in the image of God is we are three distinct parts that make up one being. So is it the same Hebrew word then that's used for this as in Psalm 89, where it's talking about the sons of God or the heavenly beings? Uh, no, I, I don't think it is. Um, the, the heavenly council... Now, God said this in front of the Heavenly Council, which the Heavenly Council are the angels, the angels who were created. And it doesn't say in this, in this creation story when the angels were made. The suggestion is that they were in day one. You know, when God said, let there be light, in that process, he created the realm of heaven, and in that, he created the angels as well. They are created beings. Um, the only uncreated being, we're going to talk about that today, is God. And so at some point he created the angels. The angels don't die, but um, we are unique. You know, we are, are um, actually superior to the angels. It says we will judge all, including the angels, because we are made directly in the image of God, but we are fallen. Okay. Um, the, the confusion on this, I think, comes from uh, this, where he talks about in the middle of 67. He says this, Before leaving the subject of polytheism, let us consider a major metaphor. He calls this a metaphor that Israel adopted to portray Yahweh's relation to the gods of the surrounding world. These gods were considered to be members of the heavenly council over which Yahweh, the supreme God, presided as king. He gives the illusion that, that Israel adopted these lesser gods of the Canaanites and form some kind of heavenly council. That's where the confusion comes in. Now, what you were talking about, the evangelical response to that is, is probably more accurate being the Trinity. Okay. But, but, um, He's not incorrect. The Israelites did accept other gods. Not well, then why were they... Not that they should have. But they were constantly exhorted to, to abandon those other gods. Exactly. And we're going to talk about that. Well, they're constantly exhorted after uh, Exodus 30. We're going to talk about that. Okay. There's no, there's no command by God not to have other recognize other divine beings prior to the giving of the law. Really. Okay. 
Okay, and we'll talk about that. And then, in fact, that's something I'm going to focus on today. All right. Any other burning questions from your reading? I some, some of this we will get into. I got one more. Okay. Who is, in '71? Who is the Elohistic Psalter? And uh, uh, what authority does he support this suggestion of using God instead of Lord? He's all inclusive here. You know, he's talking about new, gender neutrality and right. that sort of thing. And who's this Elohistic Psalter in which he places all of this, uh, this authority right. to make these kinds of proclamations? This is the documentary <coughs> hypothesis. We just bumped into it. Elohistic, uh, the Eloist and the Eloistic uh, Psalter, Psalm 43 right. to 83, are 40 psalms that specifically reflect uh -huh. the use of the word Elohim for God. So whoever that is. Yeah, well, and the idea is Anderson is feeding back the documentary hypothesis of um, Altruk and, and Wellhausen and others that want that the Pentateuch was written and then some right. the psalm, some of the Psalms as well by four predominant authors: the Yahwist J, the Elohist E, uh, the Deuteronomist D, and the priestly writers P. E of the JEPD is the Elohist, and so not only is the is part of the uh, the Pentateuch, but some people believe that at least 40 of the Psalms, because of the fact that the Elohim is used in that, were also by that, that source. And if we don't believe in JEPD, we don't believe in that source. So, See, he, he, develops, he develops a whole system of interpretation based on that, which includes uh, gender, uh, neutrality, and, and using Jesus. Why, why, why use, instead of in John 3.16, for God sent His only beloved Son. No, he doesn't only... advocate that. And again, it's hard to read because it sounds like he is, but then in several instances, that's one of them, he comes back around and says, you know, it is what it is. Don't screw around with it. We can't, we can't overplay the whole desire to be gender neutral. Okay, And right, so don't does. do that. Take the word for what it says. But before he gets to that, he wanders through what all these other people have said, and you're not quite sure where he's going to end up. It's a little confusing in that regard. Okay? One more, and then I'm gonna, we're going to start. Okay? Google is really useful. Google. I read this uh, sitting in front of Google. And Good. <laughs> it was very helpful. Um, all right. Yeah, and somebody else said they had, you know, book, dictionary, and the computer, and they're they're trying to work between them. This is the uh, outline that you have that we're going to be following today. We're going to look at last week we did the introduction, and that those videos will be up. I promise you. Theology of God, or Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, is what we're talking about today. Then, at, starting from today on, we're going to be dealing with theologies every week. Major theologies that are, that are given to us through the Old Testament. Alright, so today, let's talk about the theology of God. I want to give you a little bit of sense of the cultural environment of the ancient Near East. The Near East is the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. We looked at the map the other day. It in, includes the Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, where... Abraham came from, and part of that, Haran and other places, people keep wandering back to, um, and uh, Jacob goes there for a while. Then the Levant, or Palestine, or Canaan, depending upon what time period you're talking about, has had many different names. And then Egypt as well. All of that area is what we call the ancient Near East, the whole eastern, um, eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Okay? Now... It's important to recognize that there were many civilizations and many gods that existed before Israel came along, even before Abraham was called, and certainly before Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. Uh, before Abraham, you already had cultures in, Sum in the, the Sumerian culture, in Mesopotamia, you already had Egypt, all of them had their own um, pantheons of gods. They had already developed a sense of that. You even had the desert peoples were worshiping jinns, J-I-N-N-S, which is where we get the word genie, the idea of a spirit. In, in Islam, a jinn or a genie is, uh, is a demon. That's, their ref that's how they refer to demons, which sort of gets, gets the idea of demon worship having happened early on. There were already people who were worshiping the ghosts of their ancestors which we have even today in some of the Asian religions. For instance, um, Shinto in Japan involves uh, honoring your ancestors. There already were animistic kinds of religions where people were worshiping natural uh, phenomena, the spirits of natural phenomena. 
the spirit of the trees and the spirit of the ocean and the spirit of the mountain kind of thing, trying to make sure that they kept them satisfied so that they wouldn't do them harm. That sort of thing happens today in primitive parts of the world. It's called animism, and it has made a big return in the New Age movement. Carolyn and I have a good friend whose sister is very New Agey, and she sort of almost worships the spirit of the wolf. Okay, it's sort of Native American, animistic, you know, kinds of stuff. So that was already happening. But particularly, they're already, in the case of the Sumerians and the Egyptians and a few other places, they already were developing pantheons of God. Pantheon is a high council. When you talk about a pantheon of gods, the ones we know most now, historically, was that Greece had a pantheon of gods, you know, the gods Zeus and others. Uh, and then Rome had a pantheon of gods. Rome, uh, I've said before, the Romans were very efficient. They didn't have to come up with their own gods. They just took the Greek gods and renamed them with Latin names. So the Greek gods and the Roman gods all line up. Uh, but this idea that when it, by the time Israel came along, there already were, were cultures and civilizations that existed, and they already had their own deities. In fact, by the time Israel entered into Canaan, which means after the 40 years in the desert when they entered into the Promised Land, that's when they entered Canaan, uh, you, you've got Abraham and his folks spent time in Canaan, but then they went into Egypt. When they came back after the, the Egyptian sojourn and the 40 years in the desert under Moses, when they entered the Canaan, there were many gods that were existent. I want to talk about a few of those because you're going to bump into some of these in the Bible. Not just in terms of studying other stuff, but these are gods that are mentioned in the Bible. I want to give you a little bit of sense of who they are, where they came from. And then I want to come back around and try to connect that with our monotheistic belief. You know what monotheism is? It means belief in one God. Actually, I'm not a monotheist. Well, I guess I am. I'm probably, um, and, and I'll explain that to you. Okay. I just wanted to scare you. One of the gods that uh, the Israelites discovered when they came into Canaan was the god El. El was the supreme god of the Canaanite uh, pantheon. Whenever you had a pantheon of gods, there would be there's a different level, different levels of them, and the highest of all in the Canaanite pantheon was El. Interestingly enough, the Canaanites perceived El as being kind, compassionate. He was the father of the gods, he was the father of all humanity, he was, the, he, he was the maker of all creatures, he was a righteous judge, he was protector of the weak. Does this sound familiar? Um, El became, in the Bible, and in, that, in the period of the Old Testament, became a generic word for God. In fact, the, um, the, the name El came to be used, and in fact, some of the names that were used by the Canaanites for God El were adopted by the Israelites to refer to their God, who later was named Yahweh. Some of those you might name, uh, you might recognize, and I'll, I'll talk about them later. El Shaddai, El Elyon, El Olam. These, these El names existed before the Israelites started using them, because they were used with reference to the great God El. Um, while virtually every other god that we're going to mention here is specifically condemned in the Bible, the god El is never condemned in the Bible. And I'm going to talk about why I think that is in just a minute. Okay. Where in the Bible do they talk about? They don't talk about, well, El is not mentioned as a separate god. We know this from other writings. Um, there was a culture, um, the culture of the Ugarids. In fact, if you go to a really high class, really demanding school and you study Old Testament, like Fuller Theological Seminary where I went to, if I wanted to study Old Testament, I would have to prove competency in Hebrew, Greek, um, Aramaic, Ugaritic, Akkadian, and Latin. I have to have six, six languages in order to, to pursue a PhD there. That's PhD level, not, not undergraduate. So you get the idea. An Ugaritic, uh, the Ugaritic culture was destroyed uh, in, in like 1200, but there were a lot of documents that were left over. And so we know a lot about them and about, the, and they were Canaanite um, culture. And so that's, that's why you study Ugaritic as a language, because their documents tell us a lot about this and they have a lot about El. Okay? Um, I'm going to come back to El shortly and what I think the connection was there. A second. Uh, a second deity that you'll read about in scripture 
is Asherah. Asherah is a woman. It's a female deity. She was considered to be uh, the wife to El. She is sometimes referred to in other documents as the Queen of Heaven. Like scripture in one place, I think they call her the Queen of Heaven. She was considered one of the oldest deities. You will read about Asherah poles in the Bible, about how that was an abomination. And all of these kings that come along, even the good ones, even the ones that tried to, to get the uh, Israelites straightened up and worshiping in the right way, in almost every case it says, but they didn't cut down the Asherah poles. Partly because as a female deity, she was really popular. Right? And you have a lot of syncretism going on right there, a combining of things. Uh, Josiah, one of the best of the kings of, Israel, of uh, Judah, he actually went the whole way. He got rid of everything, including destroying the temples that Solomon had set up. We'll discuss that when we get to Chemnach, all right? Yeah, Solomon, the wisest of men, who, son of David, captured God's heart. You know, God was so pleased with him before the end of his life because of, he married so many women from other cultures, which he wasn't supposed to do. He also was not supposed to get a lot of horses. He did that. The reason why a horse is a sign of war. Anytime you read about a horse in the Bible, it's about it. horses were only used for one thing. They were used for war. Mm. If you wanted to just ride someplace, you rode on a donkey. You didn't ride on a horse. Horses were for war. Mm. And Solomon worshipped other gods, or allowed the worship at least, of other gods because his wives worshipped those gods. And he even set up places of worship for them. And he brought in horses from everywhere around the eastern Mediterranean that made them. That made them, that grew, that, uh, grew them, that bred them. There you, there you go. <laughs> um, so Asherah is the wife or the consort of El. There's there are a couple of other high gods of pantheons around that part of the world that she was also a, a version, maybe a different name, but basically the same deity. There are some scholars who say that Asherah was perceived by the Israelites as being God, Yahweh God's wife or his consort. Um, there, in fact, there was an article not too long ago that I read called, um, you know, God Had a Wife. And it was in, like, Biblical Archaeological Review or one of those magazines. And they found documentation. There was one uh, pottery shard that they found that has three figures on it. And the caption says, Yahweh and the consort Asherah. Now, People, liberal scholars, immediately go, Oh, well, Asherah was just as much of a god as Yahweh was. Well, you know what? Human beings, we are always trying to mix, mix things together. Syncretism, there's a word for that. Syncretism, where we take a little of this and a little of that, a little something else, whatever feels good, and we try to put it all together. You all know what Santeria is? Santeria is a, is a Latin religion, Latin American religion, that takes the Catholic theology, particularly the theology of the saints, and mixes it with voodoo, mixes it with a spirit worship from the Caribbean, and so you get these altars with these spirit gods, I mean, you see this on TV shows and stuff, but it became uh, pretty, probably 20 years ago, there were several murders that were committed as a human sacrifice because of this, these drug users that were Santeria followers. That sort of thing has been happening since the beginning of humanity. And one of the things that Scripture criticizes the Israelites for is the fact that they continued to worship other gods at the same time they were worshiping Yahweh. So the fact that they have found pottery or anything else that suggests that people were worshiping Yahweh and maybe thinking of Asherah as his wife does not surprise me. That doesn't mean that that, that was right. It means the Israelites were screwing up, as humans are prone to, do, prone to do and as Scripture talks about them doing. You know, when Josiah had to go in and clean all this stuff out, they were still worshiping Yahweh, but they were also worshiping all these other gods, including probably, and most certainly Asherah, because it specifically says he, just, he was the first one to really destroy the Asherah poles. Okay? Now, uh, keep going on some of these. Baal. You've seen the name Baal if you've read any of the Old Testament. The name Baal actually was often used as a generic. It means Lord or Master in, in an ancient Canaanite language. Um, but it sometimes was used to refer to a specific God. You'll actually read the admonition in the Old Testament that the people were worshiping the Baals, plural, yeah, because it became sort of synonymous with whatever God wasn't, well, the one true creator God, Yahweh. Okay. So, um, but you have cases like Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where he, wonderful story, where Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and he, they're, it's just him and 450 of them, 
and he, they build altars and they cry out all day and cut themselves and scream and bang drums and everything else and Elijah's teasing them the whole time saying what's wrong is your God asleep, is he gone away, are you trying to wake him up, are you trying to get his attention, what's wrong and then he has them dump water and then more water on the altar and he calls out to God and says show up you know the altar of God is burned up despite all the water on it and so all the people get together and they kill all the prophets of Baal. Well, this is during the time of Ahab and Jezebel, the horror, probably the worst of the rulers of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, northern kingdom of Israel. And um, then Elijah has to run for his life. But that was against Elijah the prophet serving the one true God, Yahweh, versus the prophets of Baal. So he was both an individual um, God and he also, that name became synonymous. <coughs> Uh, Beelzebub, you all have heard of Beelzebub, right? That's actually Baal Zebub, which means, um, since Baal means Lord, and Zebub means the flies. It's Lord of the Flies. That's where Golding got the name for his book, the Lord of the Flies. And the reason why Beelzebub or, became a name for Baal is because the Lord of the Flies, the, the Jewish scholars, were not we're pretty obviously relating Baal to a dung heap, you know, a pile of dung that the flies were around all the time. So they named Baal Beelzebub. And in the New Testament, that name is applied to Satan. Okay? So, but it all goes back to that idea of Baal. Then you get Chemosh, the god of the Moabites. Scripture talks about the uh, abomination of the Moabites. In, in certain places, they, it refers to the people of Chemosh being the Moabites. Now, um, Chemosh was connected to another god I'm going to mention in just a minute, Molech. Chemosh was the god of the Moabites. Molech was the god of the Ammonites. Well, the Moabites and the Ammonites were all descendants of two of Lot's sons. So these were cousins to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they developed as different peoples. Okay? They were still Semitic, because all of these folks came down from Shem. Okay? Son of Noah. So these are other gods that developed amongst other Semitic people who were relatives of Abraham and his family, of the, of the Jews. Okay. Now, um, Chemosh was one of the gods that Solomon built a place of worship to, a sanctuary, uh, on the Mount of Olives, of all places. And he, uh, this is talked about in 1 Kings 11, 7, and then Josiah comes along and Josiah gets rid of it. Chemosh was one of the really horrible ones because he's one that demanded child sacrifice. And the Israelites were sacrificing their children. Same thing with Moloch or Moloch. Um, they, in the case of Moloch, they would have these large altars, you know, made out of stone and clay, dried clay. They would build fires inside and they would take their babies, their children, and put them up. And it was made in the form of a large mouth, like the mouth of the god, would lay their children in there and the children alive would roll down into the fire. These were the Israelites doing this. Okay. The whole idea of um, hell being a place of brimstone, fire and brimstone comes from the fact they were doing this in the Valley of Gehenna, which is right outside the wall of Jerusalem. The fires of, of worship and frequently, and it, it's not like they sacrificed people constantly or children constantly, but they did it often enough that this idea of the stink and brimstone and fire and smoke as representing evil the whole, a lot of the concept that carries down to us of what hell is and was like comes from that. The worship of these pagan gods by, by child sacrifice right outside the walls of Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, then you've got Dagon. Dagon was an Assyrian, uh, Assyro-Babylonian, meaning, meaning Assyria and Babylon, fertility god. He was worshipped by the early Amorites and later the Philistines. Um, you remember Samson and Delilah. Okay, remember how Samson died? They cut his hair so that they could grab him. They take him, the Philistines, that's who he's, or Philistines, depending on how you want to pronounce it. They take him and they take him to the temple of the Philistines and they chain him between two pillars. And Samson prays for God to give him one last bit of strength and he pushes on the pillars, collapses the pillars, and because everybody had gotten together to make fun of and see blinded Samson, who had been the bane of the Philistine people. They all got together to see this in their big temple. He pushes the pillars, the roof comes down, kills all these guys. Well, that was the temple of Dagon. 
That was the later the Philistine or Philistine uh, god, and so the temple of Dagon, and it mentions that in Judges 16.23, Judges 16.23 by name. Now, um, there's also, in 1 Samuel, we have the story of um, the Philistines at one point capture the Ark of the Covenant in battle. They've taken the Ark of the Covenant out the Israelites. They don't really have faith in God. They lose the battle. The Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant. And they take it back to, to their land, and they take it to the Temple of Dagon. And they, they put it in the Temple of Dagon as though, like, a tribute to their god Dagon. Well, the next morning, First Samuel says, they come in and the, the image of the god Dagon has fallen over on its face in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And they go, what's going on here? So they set it up right again. Next morning they come back and it's fallen over again, plus its head and its hands have been, have been broken off and are someplace else. They're, all, they're laying across the threshold. I've often wondered if that's where Steven Spielberg gets the, some of the ideas from the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember at the very end? Uh, well, what, not at the very end. It, it, when uh, the Ark of the Covenant is in a box and it's got the um, swastika on it, the symbol of evil, and it is at the end. And then you see it starts blackening, and it blackens until all of the swastika and the symbol of Nazism is gone. You know, it's like evil couldn't stand in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, that story is from 1 Samuel. It's, it's the Dagon and the, and the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Then, we've looked at these. The next one is Marduk. Marduk was the patron um, god of Babylon. He started out lower and then worked his way up the ladder until he became the head of the Babylonian pantheon. I don't know exactly how they worked their way up the ladder, but apparently he did. He was the god of linked to water, vegetation, and magic. So um, he would have been involved in when the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom. And then you get Moloch, which I mentioned. Moloch and Chemosh are connected. Moloch being the god of the Ammonites. Chemosh, um, Chemosh the god of the um, Moabites. Moabites and Ammonites were cousins to each other, and so there's probably some crossover there. He was um, worshipped by the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, the coastal people. And again, just like with Chemosh, there was child sacrifice involved. And here's some scripture, some verses you can look up. It was uh, Moloch, more so probably than Chemosh, that the, the fires of Gehenna that came to symbolize fire and brimstone and hell, um, because the, actually the, the place where they worship uh, Chemosh the sort of partner god, was up on top of the Mount of Olives, which is on the other side of town. But um, you get the idea. So all of these were gods that existed when Israel came into the land of Canaan. Now, um, I believe, and not just me, but others, it is likely that Israel was, up until Isaiah 30, or Isaiah, Exodus 30, that Israel was a henotheistic culture rather than monotheistic. Henotheism, and I have a definition for you here, is the belief and worship of a single God while accepting the existence or possible existence of other deities that may also be worshipped. In other words, you say, this is the God that we're going to worship, but we're not denying the fact there are other gods around. There are a number of places in Scripture that suggest this. Uh, Genesis 31 is the story, you remember Jacob has worked for his father, his, actually it's his uncle, who becomes his father-in-law, for seven years to marry Rachel. He gets tricked and ends up getting Leah the night of their wedding. So he works seven more years to get uh, Rachel, and then he works longer than that. He ends up finally running for it, to get away from Laban. But Rachel, his wife, takes her father's household gods which are, uh, the word for that is teraphim, the household gods. In those days, everybody would have sort of their little patron gods. So Laban goes running after them, and the biggest heartburn that he's got, he says, why, why are you leaving? Why did you leave in the middle of the night? Why didn't you stop and say, you know, bye, whatever. The biggest problem he's got is that they took his household gods. Well, Rachel has them. She puts them under her saddle, sits on her saddle in her tent, and says, I'm sorry, I can't get up. I'm having my period. Well... A woman who was having her period is unclean, so they wouldn't bodily pick her up. And so they said, well, okay. And so they didn't find them. But the point is that in Jacob's time, this is the third generation of patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people had household gods. Okay. Um, so 
that's one. Another one is in 1 Samuel 26, verse 18 and following. David, when he's had to leave because of Saul, Saul has chased him off. At one point, he confronts Saul. And it, it's, it, it does, this happens fairly often when David, sort of across a ravine or in some protected way, when he talks to Saul about how unjust it is that he's, he's been loyal to Saul and Saul has chased him off. At this point, David appeals to Saul and he says that he's been, because David has been driven away from the place where God is, that people are saying, well, now you have to worship other gods. There's a very clear indication there that David is saying, even the Israelites perceived that there were different gods who were responsible for different geographical areas. Doesn't mean that David wanted to worship some other god, but David seems, along with everybody else, to be saying there are other gods that could be worshipped, even though we believe that there's Yahweh is the god. And then finally, in Judges 11.21, one of the judges, Jephthah, talks about the other gods, including some of the ones that we've looked at, as being real, and that they, but they couldn't stand up to, um, to Yahweh. They couldn't stand up to the one true God. Now, how are we supposed to understand that? Um, to me, oh, and one other thing, point I want to make before I get into the explanation. I believe that henotheism, the idea that there is one God that we worship, but there are also other gods, is actually reflected in the Ten Commandments. The first two commandments, which confuses people. In fact, the Catholics, the, uh, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, they tend to think that, that the first and second commandment, as we Protestants call it, the rest of the Protestants, that that's, that's one commandment. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not uh, make or worship idols. And then they take the Tenth Commandment in a very strange way and break it too, which doesn't make any sense to me. That means there's a commandment about not coveting your neighbor's house. My neighbor doesn't have that great a house. I don't think it deserves its own commandment. But, so we have, as two different commandments, one and two, the first one is, you shall have no other gods before me. I believe that's a way that, that God is saying to the Israelites in the Ten Commandments, I must be your primary God. No other gods before me. It doesn't say there aren't any other gods. You shall have no other gods before me. And then, the second commandment is, do not make or worship idols. And I believe that's a way of saying, not only can you not have any other god before me, but you can no longer have any secondary gods, or teraphim, household gods, small gods. Right? To me, that's why those two things are different. Is God is saying, I have to be first, and not only do I have to be first, but you can't have any others anymore, like you have up until now. Let me tell you why I think that, that makes sense. This in no way suggests that God is less, or that God is only one of many gods, but instead, to my mind, this indicates that God truly is greater. Now, the point is, there are other spiritual beings. That's part of Scripture. People who say, well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in this whole devil and demons and angels stuff. Well, I'm sorry, then you don't believe in God. Because it's a package deal. The same scripture, the same authority that tells us that there is a God in heaven whose Son is Jesus Christ tells us there are angels and there are demons, there is a Satan, there are other spiritual beings. And those spiritual beings have been worshipped and could have been identified or thought of as gods. I believe that Baal and Molech and Chemosh and Dagon were real spiritual entities and that they still exist. Because they don't die. Angels and demons don't die. Some people have worshipped them as gods. I don't think they are. I think they were created by the one true God, who himself is uncreated. You see where I'm going with that? The Israelites, along with everybody else, even after the Israelites recognized that there was one true God, and they even knew his name Yahweh, until the law was given, they saw these other beings being worshipped and thought, well, yeah, they're real. Well, they are real. But they are not God, God. The capital G. The second thing, I think, is if other cultures had gods that looked like or sounded like Yahweh, particularly El, the one God that is not condemned in the Bible, the one God who's the description of which looks exactly like the God we worship as Yahweh, the God whose name the Israelites names, like El Shaddai, uh, El Olam, etc., they borrowed those names. I think what that that likely indicates is that rather than that dispro disproving that God, the Creator God, Yahweh, 
Rather than saying he isn't real, I think that suggests that other people groups perhaps had unclear glimpses that there was a God like this and began to worship him because they, you know, they got, they got a little bit of it, but not enough. They didn't have the revelation that God gave to the Israelites. I believe that's just like the flood story idea. As I mentioned before, it was at this class or the survey class, um, we talk about Noah's flood. That was the survey class. Um, the story of the flood exists in cultures all over the world, including in Central America. There are stories about a great flood. In fact, the Gilgamesh epic from, from uh, Mesopotamia has astonishing parallels with the, the biblical story of Noah and the flood, even that they, they sent out two birds and all kinds of stuff. Well, liberals have said, well, that proves that the, the Noah story isn't true. I look at that and I go, sounds to me like it is true. And that there are other cultures that have stories that reflect what was a real historical event. All right? Same thing. I believe that if you have, like the Canaanite cultures who, who have this God called El and they describe him in a way that sounds a whole lot like Yahweh, it's not that that's an equal God to Yahweh. I think it is Yahweh. They just see him through a glass darkly. They don't have a clear view of him, understanding, because he didn't reveal himself particularly to them like he did to the Jews. It does not take anything away from God. If anything, I believe it gives us more support for what we believe to be the one true God. John? You know, that even exists today uh, in some tribes in the, on the mission field. Mm -hmm. Some tribes that are severely isolated from everyone else. There is a, there's a sense of the supernatural. And they, they have, uh, according to what they are able to recognize, this recognition of a God. Now, they just can't articulate it. They don't understand Jesus and the redemption that he purchased. Right. But there is, within the heart of man, this, this recognition, you know. I mean, you can go even to the most isolated today in 2012 right. and find uh, cultures that have uh, been just like you described. Just a flicker. I mean, they get, they get a glimpse, and it's unclear, and it's not well defined, but when we see those things and we say, I can see how that might be a blurry version of what we know to be the truth, because God gave a clear revelation to the Hebrew people that we have inherited. Michael? Um, do you disagree with the idea that for all of time, we've, mankind has created their own gods, that the gods are not there's no other real gods ordained or created by God. The, the, people make their gods. I think the story of the, the golden calf or the history of creating a golden calf shows that we make our own gods and we make gods out of things. Right. Well, I think and we talked about this difference once before. Uh, this is in Bible study. We talked about idols. When it says you will, you will not make any idols in the form of anything on the earth or above the earth or under the sea. And you will not worship anything, okay? The golden calf to the Israelites represented a spiritual being. They weren't just, they weren't worshiping this because it was gold or because it was in the shape of a calf. The bull god, that's one of the names for El. The, in fact, almost every, every Mesopotamian culture that had a pantheon of gods, they associated the bull with the highest of the gods, okay? Now, so, yes, we, we make our own images of gods, but I believe that uh, when people worship something as a god, it's because there really is a spiritual being there. It's a created spiritual being. Mm -hmm. God made the angels. God made the demons. And those demons love nothing better than to fool people into worshiping them. And so I believe that down through history, what we have seen in, in Chemosh, in Molech, in Baal, and Asherah are spiritual beings that have convinced some people that they were divine, that they were a god or the god even, to worship them. And then they create poles to worship Asherah, or they create golden calves to recognize El the bull god, or whatever. So the making of idols is a, to try to have a physical focus for our attention to represent a spiritual something that we worship. American Idol, okay? There isn't actually an idol. What are we, what are we, what is that referring to? It's referring to this we worship this idea of being famous, of having everybody tell you you're the most talented person in the world. Well, that's what an idol is before before it's a physical thing. Okay, now we do we do make our own images, 
But the images reflect something that's behind that, and I believe that has to do with the deception of human beings by spiritual, by evil spiritual beings. David. A modern extension of that would not be the Catholic Church. Well, um, for some in the Catholic Church, or the Orthodox Church, or the Baptist Church, or the Presbyterian Church, there, there are there are people that we take we take symbols. I mean, in, in the case of the um, the churches that are more iconic that use icons, the purpose of an icon, a Greek Orthodox Church even more so, is to focus our attention on the things of God. Unfortunately, human beings being very faulty creatures, we sometimes end up making that the object of our worship. Um, I don't think they're originally intended to be that way, but sometimes we do that. There are some people that um, that worship this. Bibleolatry is a word that's been coined. That we worship the Bible instead of what the Bible teaches us. You know, the truth of it. Um, so yeah, human nature is that we're always trying to fill some void, some gap, and we often find the wrong thing to, to use. Okay, Ron, first. The, queen, the queen of Heaven... Uh, that saying is, is very much alive in the Roman Church. Guadalupe is considered, or yeah. Mary. Mary, Virgin Guadalupe. I think there are, uh, I mourn over the number of people who I believe are misled in those directions. I also know Catholics who love the Lord Jesus more than anything, and so I don't condemn all Catholics or the Catholic Church. I think that some of the, the, the ecclesiology, the way they do church of the Catholic Church, tends to be more prone to lead people in that direction, and that saddens me. But you know, I'm not I'm not picking on the Catholic Church. I think there are Protestants who have things just just the same way. Uh, yes. So these gods, well, these demons, basically, were yep. worshipped as gods. Um, they obviously had some sort of power, mm -hmm. and so by inference, they still exist, and they still have power over people. Correct. I believe so. Uh, yeah, uh, there are demonic forces in the world that still exert power. Well, that's what Paul said in, in Ephesians yeah. about principalities and powers. Absolutely, yeah. powers and principalities, powers of the spirit of the air, and all kinds of things. So yes, they still exist, and they are still real. And I believe they're responsible, for instance, for misleading people, and thinking that they're worshiping God when in fact they're worshiping graven images sometimes. So there are aspects of that that are real. Uh, the whole New Age movement is a revival of, of, of looking for meaning and truth in the wrong place. And it's not new age, it's very, very old age, because it's basically a retelling of all this stuff. Okay. Anything else on this? This is a big one. Because to me, it is, it is, I, I gave you some of the references. These these gods are talked about, they're talked about as being real in the Old Testament. Nowhere in scripture does it say, oh, Kimnosh isn't real, oh, Moloch isn't real, oh, Baal isn't real. In fact, quite the contrary, scripture takes them very seriously. So it's not that they're not real, it's that they're dangerous, scary, and you mess with them at your own risk, and you mess with them at the exclusion of the one true God who is uncreated, who does deserve our worship. Okay? This is, I think this is a critical understanding of, of the foundation, the background foundation, of what um, the understanding of the Hebrew the Israelites had of God in the Old Testament. Because this is the culture, this is the milieu in which they came to be believers and followers of hmm. Yahweh, the one true Incredible. God. Incredible. Yes. Well, I was Incredible. just thinking about the Mexican culture, you know, and uh, the Popol Vuh, which is considered the Mexican Bible of Indians, starts exactly like the same Bible, like our Bible, in the beginning there was. And I think it's the nature of men to search for something. We need God. Right. And is the evil nature of men to create bad gods, like we see the post, to kill right. people. And it, it's, it's part of our, our ourselves. We know there's something wrong with us. Um, Augustine said there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person. A vacuum. Nature affords a vacuum. I, mean, I refer to this in Sermon on Sunday. And so no, sensing this vacuum, having this feeling that there's something empty in me that needs to be filled, we grasp and struggle to find something that will fill that. And many of the things that humanity finds will not fill that. They're false. And yet we find ourselves far down the road worshiping a false god, trying to fill that void when there is only one god that is the shape of that vacuum that will fill that. Okay, Becky? 
about Jesus did three things. He preached the gospel of the, of the kingdom of God. He um, healed people from physical illness and he drove out demons. It's interesting that healing people from illness and driving out demons are both mentioned all the way through the New Testament or the gospels because some people, as I've said before, some people see a demon under every bush. Oh, I woke up with a sniffles this morning. It must be a demon. Okay. Um, or any illness is a demon. No, it's not. Some, some illnesses are because you got a germ. Okay, some illnesses are illnesses, but demons are real. Or else we have to throw away the biggest part of the New Testament that deals with that. First in the back again. I just want to just say one more thing, and that is that the fact that the, those demons recognized him as authority, and exactly. Jesus just thought, of, you know, I didn't scare him, and it didn't, you know, they recognized him as the high, God was high. Exactly, they knew he was the Son of God. Um, and it's, inter it's interesting that, and I may be wrong in this, so correct me, but I cannot recall where anybody ever cast out demons before Jesus comes up on the show. And when Jesus comes, he, he presents this, this conflict, you know, and demonstrates his all infinite power over demonic uh, powers in a way that you never see by the Old Testament prophets. You never see, they're, they're told to avoid them. They're told to, the, 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 in the Old Testament, you're told to avoid them. But Jesus comes, and he not only does it himself, but he commissions his believers to not just avoid them, but to cast them out. Confront them, yes. Yes. Uh, I agree. Now, this is what I meant earlier when I said that I may not be a monotheist, uh, but rather an enotheist, meaning I believe there are other spiritual entities that have been worshipped as gods. And, you know, what's your definition of God? If it's God with a small g, it means a spiritual being that has some power, maybe. Okay. I believe those are real. There are demons, there are angels. That's scriptural. But there is one true God. There is only one being that is uncreated, himself responsible for creating all that is. And so, in that regard, I'm a monotheist. But you understand what I mean when I said that, when I said I may not be a monotheist, is because I believe there are other spiritual powers that have at various times convinced people to worship them as gods. Yes? Well, on a personal level, there's one of those demons at the exit of Walmart. Okay. <laughs> that gal there with all those donuts. Okay. <laughs> Cast them out. Cast them out. We all have our own personal demons, right? Okay. So this is sort of uh, the, the background. I want to get. I want to do one more point, and then we'll take a break for a few minutes, and then come back. But the whole rest of the class, I want to talk about ways in which God is presented, or the way in which God appears in the Old Testament. I want to look at particular characteristics. The first one, the foundational one is that in the Old Testament, God is, and, I, and notice this is Old Testament theology, so I am going to avoid New Testament references. I'm not going to be talking about Jesus, not because I don't think it all doesn't point to Jesus, but because this is Old Testament theology. The New Testament fulfills this and completes it, but our focus in this class is Old Testament theology. So the first way in which God appears in the Old Testament is as the God who is. Lest you think I'm just trying to do, you know, play philosophical word games. There's a reason why I said it that way. When, um, when Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3 is called, God calls Moses by name and calls him over. And God sees this bush that is burning but is not consumed. And he says, I'm going to go see what this is. This is not something you see every day. So he, he goes over there and God speaks to him. And it says, Moses said to God, when God tells him, I, I, I've seen the plight of the Israelites in bondage in Egypt. I want you to go get them out. And Moses, starting in verse 13, said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers, because he's already said, um, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, the fathers. Suppose I go to them and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? which is characteristic of the fact that almost all the gods that they recognized had names, including the Egyptian gods. Then what shall I tell them? Moses, uh, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am 
has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. The reference is here to um, I am, or I am who I am, and the, the Hebrew can be translated, um, I will be what I will be, or I will be who I will be, is the proper name of God from this point on. It is what we know as Yahweh. Okay. Y-H-W-H. Now, let me give that to you. It's called the Tetragrammaton. Is that not a cool word or what? Okay. This is like Transformers. Um, tetragrammaton means the four letters. But it's cool that the four letters sound so awesome. The Tetragrammaton is the proper name of God. It is, this is the proper name of God, read right to left. There are four letters. There is the Yod, He, Vav, and He, from right to left. These things down here, remember what those are called? Well, vowel points. They are the breathing sounds. Okay, uh, ancient, as we've talked about, ancient writing, ancient languages did not have vowels. Vowels are only necessary in order to know how to pronounce something. A-I-I-O-U, -I 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 they're breathing sounds. Ancient languages, like Hebrew, were written down only with consonants. Then they had to teach people, teach young people, how to read it. That's why one of the signs of becoming an adult in the Jewish faith, the bar mitzvah, a young boy has to stand up in front of the congregation and read from the Torah, from the book of the law, books of the law, to show that I have studied and I know how this is done. And I can, I can assume the role of an adult, because part of the role of the adult in the Jewish community is to be able to read the Torah. So, these are vowel points which tell us how to pronounce it. The problem is, as I mentioned previously in one of these classes, um, when the Jews came to this name, the, the Tetragrammaton, these four letters, Yod, He, Vav, He, which is the proper name of God, which we pronounce now Yahweh, they were not allowed to say that, lest they do it in vain and break one of the Ten Commandments. So whenever they came to that word, that name of God, they would substitute the word Adonai, which means Lord. They would use a generic instead. So what happened was, when the Masoretes in the 7th through the 11th century AD went in and put in all the vowel points and they put in the, accent, the cantillation, you know, how to, what the rhythms should be in the accents, they put in the vowel points for Adonai. So that when young boys are learning how to read this, when they get to the proper name of God, Yahweh, they weren't supposed to pronounce that. The vowel points were from Adonai, the generic word Lord. Later on, Christians who did not know what they were doing took the Hebrew consonants, Yahweh, and the vowel points from uh, Adonai. They put them together and they got the word Jehovah. There is no such word as Jehovah. It's not to say it's necessarily wrong because we don't know what the real vowels are. Because they never pronounced it for 2,000 years, the Hebrew people forgot how to pronounce the proper name of God. And so we think, based upon the rules of Hebrew, that it probably is the equivalent of Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E or Yahweh. But the Hebrew was only four letters, which is, this is the transliteration. Transliteration means if you, if you try to do literal character to character trans, you know, changing, then this Y-H-W-H -H would be so, the Tetragrammaton, the proper name for God. Now, once this was given in Exodus 3, because Moses later writes down, and we believe Moses is, is by far the, the majority of, is majority responsible for the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, or the Torah. Torah is the Hebrew law of the first five books. Pentateuch is the Greek word meaning the five books. Because Moses went back later and wrote those books for us, the word, the name Yahweh is, is used throughout the Pentateuch. The first time it's used is in Genesis 2, very early in the whole thing. Do you know how in your English Bibles you can know when the proper name of God is used? Anybody? It's all in caps. It's all in caps. It's in small caps. If you look in your Bible, in fact, you might want to do that. Uh, Look at it, um, go right now to Exodus, well, they don't have Lord number because they use the I am. 
Um, don't look it up right now. You could go to Genesis 3, but uh, Genesis 2. If it's got, you know, like small caps with capital letters, that is the proper name of God, Yahweh. If it's got capital L and then O-R-D, that's Adonai. That's the generic word Lord. Okay? And that's how you can tell which name is being used in your Bible, whether it's the proper name of God or whether it's the generic word. Okay? Now, I want to talk about that for just a minute before we take a break. Um, first, there are, I mentioned Yahweh. Yahweh is the most common name for God. It's the proper name, if you will, just like my proper name is Ross. You could call me the Big Tuna, like somebody did recently, but, but that's not my proper name, okay? I had nicknames. My family called me Rusty. I mean, you could say, dude, you could call me a lot of different things. My proper name is Ross. So God had a lot of things he was called in the Bible, uh, different, different uh, synonyms for God, but the proper name is Yahweh. That's used over 6,700 times in the Old Testament. Okay, so that's the, by far the most common. The second most common is the word Elohim. See that L there? El was the became the sort of generic for God. But the word Elohim, it means God. It's a generic word which means God. That's used about 2,500 times. The third option is Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord. And again, you can tell that it's that that Lord is with capital L small O R D as opposed to all small caps, you know, capital L and then small caps of ORD, which is Yahweh. Um, that appears about 300 times. <laughs> then there are other names, which I mentioned before, names like, this is not exhaustive, there are a bunch of different names used for God. El Shaddai, which is God Almighty, El Elyon, God Most High, El Olam, the Everlasting One, and a lot of other L names. Some of these, it appears from the Ugaritic writing and, and others, were names that the Hebrew people adopted from the Canaanite religions to apply to their God. That doesn't mean there was a confusion. It's just, you know, I'm an Israelite, and I come along, and the Canaanites are calling their God, which I don't think is the high, great high God, like Yahweh, they're calling him God Almighty. And I'm going, that's a pretty cool name for my God, because I think my God is really God Almighty, not yours. So I'm going to call my God God Almighty. That doesn't in any way discount the fact that the Israelites used that as the name for God. Okay, Liberal scholars would tend to tell us, well, that... You know, that proves that it wasn't unique, or that it wasn't really the one high God, or it was the same God they were talking about, or whatever. No, it doesn't mean any of that. Human beings do stuff like that. Okay? What does that mean if Yahweh, the proper name of God, means I am, or I am who I am, or I will be who I will be? Basically, that word, Yahweh, as we know it, is a form of, of the verb to be. Okay? And, in fact, it is to be. I am. Not... Well, so what does it mean? I am means, in itself, it, it not only implies, it says that God is self-existent, meaning he doesn't depend upon anything else for his existence. I depended upon my parents. I depended upon, I depend upon Walmart's grocery department. I depend upon a lot of things for my existence. God does not. He is self-existent. He is non-contingent. Contingent means to depend on something else. Okay? God... God depends upon nothing from anybody else or anything else. He is non-contingent. There's no qualifier that will limit God. He is absolute. It means that God is independent. He is eternal. He is absolute. Again, I used that twice. He is unchanging, and even more than that, He is unchangeable. The very fact that God, His proper name means I am says God is unique in terms of being self-existent and dependent upon nothing else. There is no other creature, neither human, nor angelic, nor de uh, demonic, nor animal kingdom, nor vegetable world. Nothing else can make that claim. Only the one true God. All right? The Latin Vulgate translates Yahweh as, I am who am. The Septuagint translates it as, I am he who exists meaning self-sufficient in existence. The Arabic translation of the Old Testament uh, translates it, the eternal one who passes not away. So there are a lot of different ways they've tried to capture this. It basically is saying that God is the only divine being. He's the only being who is infinite, unlimited, immaterial, not dependent upon anything else. He, 
And the very, the very fact that I just used 50 different words to try to tell you what this means is reflective of the fact that this goes beyond our ability to fully conceive of and even more so to fully articulate. We are not able to conceive of what infinity is. We are not able to conceive of what has always been or what is so powerful as to not rely upon anything else. And yet, and so we struggle to try to find words that reflect some aspect of that, and we can never fully arrive at that. That's the nature of trying to talk about God. Okay? So when our minds fail, when our language fails, we are forced to resort either to inadequate descriptors like these, or else to poetic imagery. The book of Psalms is full of these poetic, the poetic images to try to capture the greatness, the awesomeness, the holiness of God. Because we can't really capture that in our minds or in our words. He, God is the only one who's independent among a world of other dependent beings. Uh, God is the only one who is unchangeable in a universe where everything changes. You see, if I start out and I say, well, I am, I can't stop there. And tell the truth. I have to have some other object at the end of that sentence. I am a husband, a pastor, a Presbyterian, a cowboy, you know, um, a wannabe astronaut, whatever it is. I am something. Only God can put a period at the end of the I am. Because he is without condition, without limit. He, God, does not have to follow that uh, article, which is his proper name, with anything. That is the nature of God. That is the most fundamental aspect of God. And he gives that to us in his very name. Okay, questions about that? You see where we're going with that? that? That passage in Exodus 3, which then is reflected in all of what Moses wrote throughout the whole Pentateuch and the rest of the Old Testament, is a fundamental understanding about God and how he is different than anything else. He's not just another God. Even though there may have been spiritual beings that got worshipped as gods, <coughs> he is the one who is uncontingent. Okay? Yeah. All right, I've got about seven minutes after. Let's take a break for about the end of the Old Testament. The next way I want to talk about is the God who is wholly other. The, the, the word that's used for this is the transcendence of God, holy other. To be transcendent means that God is above, that he is other than, he is distinct from all of his creation. In other words, he transcends it all. He, he um, is outside limitations. The idea of transcendence and eminence, which I'm going to talk about in a minute as the next one, um, is that God is different from us, but he has made himself available to us. He is transcendent, distant, but he is imminent, close by. A couple of verses related to that. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Psalm 97. God is above us. He is above the world. He is above the gods. He made it, but he is not inside it. Okay. And then Isaiah 55. For my thoughts, God is, this is God speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God, by the nature of being the only eternal, infinite, non-contingent, divine being ever, is outside the world. He necessarily has to be because he cannot be limited. God does not have a body. And when we talk about the uh, powers of God, that he is omniscient, and he knows everything. Um, he is uh, omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. He is uh, all-powerful, uh, omnipowerful. Those are, by de definition, things that are outside or transcendent to our experience of the world. Now, the transcendence is closely related, then, to God's sovereignty, the fact that he's in charge. Um, any boss worth their salt know that if they get too involved in the details, then they're not being a good boss. Right? If you've ever been a boss. Well, God is the boss of all that is, and so and to an extent he is not involved, he is transcendent, he is above the details. It's almost a paradox that he's also imminent, and we'll talk about that one in a minute. 
the tendency that human beings have had over time is either to deny God's transcendence but affirm his eminence, and if you deny that God is transcendent but you affirm his eminence, then you get pantheism. Pantheism is the belief that God is in the trees and in the rocks and in the fields and in the chairs and in the, you know, the God, all of that stuff is God. In other words, he's a physical presence, but you lose the transcendence, the fact that he is a divine creator. On the other hand, if you focus on the eminence, the closeness of God, and, um, I'm sorry, if you focus on the transcendence and you deny the eminence of God, if you focus on the fact that he is above everything, and you miss the fact that he is also close to us, he's, he's available to us, then you end up with deism. Deism is the, is the belief that, yes, there is a divine God, but he's not available to have a relationship with. He's not personal. You can't get to him. Some deists believe that, yes, God once was available but he cre when he created the whole world, but then he left. You know, he's, he's now in Michoacan, and he can't get to him. Okay? Um, so it is necessary for us to have this balance of transcendence, a God who is wholly other, and eminence, a God who is available and close. All right? Because those two are connected, I want to go immediately on to the God who sees. So we've talked about the God who is, the God who is wholly other, and now the God who sees, which really is the eminence of God. He is involved. He is God in a way that nothing else is. We aren't. No other spiritual beings are. That's the transcendence. But he also is available and sees what's going on in the world. The, the, the definition for eminence is that God is near. He is always present within the universe. He's available to his people, though he is other than and distinct from all creation. One of the mistakes that we make, I, I'm a huge believer that we human beings have a responsibility to take care of the planet in a much better way than we have. But the problem is that we, I, some people confuse the creation that we are supposed to be stewards of and take care of with the creator. They start worshiping the creation. They make the mistake of thinking that the divine is in this thing God has given us. It's not. The creation and the creator are different. We, we need to worship the creator and take care of the creation. But they're not the same thing. Okay? Um, Jeremiah 23 says, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him? declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heaven and the earth, declares the Lord? The idea that he sees everything. Right? Um, there are other places in the Psalms where it says that he sees me when I'm, when I'm lying down and rising up. You know, that, that God is aware all the time. He knows everything that's going on. I've got some other verses here, too. The, the title I have up there, El Roy, that's one of the other L names for God. El Roy means the one who sees. God sees everything. He is, he's, he's, He's plugged in. He's present. That's part of his eminence. That El Roy comes from the passage, Genesis 16, the story of Hagar. Hagar was the handmaiden of Sarah. And when uh, Sarah and Abraham, even though God had promised that they would have a son, they, after 10 years following God's promise, by this time um, Abraham's 99, Sarah's 89, they don't, don't think it's going to happen. So Sarah does something that was common in those cultures in that day, and we have records of it in other parts of the Canaanite cultures. She gave her handmaid, Hagar, to Abraham to bear a child. That would be the heir. Hagar has a child. who is was Ishmael, the father of all the Arabic peoples. And then Sarah gets pregnant, as God had promised, if they had just waited a little while. She gets pregnant and is pregnant with Isaac. And Sarah gets, doesn't want... Um, Hagar and her son Ishmael to be around anymore now that she's going to have a son. So she basically chases her off. And Hagar goes out in the desert with her baby and expects that she's going to die. And God appears to her and says, I'm here. I know what's going on. I am, you know, you're going to live. Your son is going to live. Your son will be the father of many people too. He ended up having 12 children, having 12 tribes under Ishmael, just like there were 12 tribes under Jacob. Um, and so at that point, she, Hagar, gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. El Roy, the one who sees. Some other passages related to that from Job 28. For he, that is God, views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. 
from Job 34. His eyes are on the ways of mortals. He sees their every step. From Psalm 33. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all humankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. There is nothing hidden from God. He is transcendent. He is above us and creation. But he is eminent. He's paying attention. He's watching. He's available to us. And finally, 2 Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those who heart, whose hearts are fully committed to him. This again is, I think, a place where our language falls apart. And we're trying to describe a God who is wholly different than us and outside the human experience in one way. And yet a God who has chosen, by his desire, to be available to us, to watch what's going on, to be involved, to be plugged in, to, to uh, be in connection with us. The transcendence and the imminence of God. He is both. And our language breaks down. Okay. In fact... One of my great heroes in the faith is G.K. Chesterton. Any of you who have heard me preach more than twice know that. So Chesterton, a lot of what Chesterton does is paradox. He talks a lot about paradox. People think a paradox is something that's, con that's contradictory. It's not. A paradox is two truths that seem like they're opposite, and yet both are true, and both need to be held. An example in the physical world, if you know anything about physics, is light. We can prove absolutely that light is made up of particles, right? Little atomic particles. But we can also prove that light is made up of waves. It can't be both, and yet we can prove both are true. This is one of the paradoxes in, in physics, in the physical world. Another paradox would be that, that Jesus was fully God, as the creeds say, and fully man. He wasn't 80-20, he wasn't 90-10, he wasn't even 50-50. He was 100% divine and 100% human. That's a paradox. We don't know how that works. That's a paradox is basically a point at which our language, our ability to articulate something that we recognize as a reality, we're no longer able to do it. We no longer can articulate. Our words fail us. Our language is insufficient to articulate some of the truths that we find in the world. Well, that's especially true about God that we run into things where our language fails us when we attempt to try to explain or even articulate, much less explain, just describe the nature of God. He is fully transcendent, completely other, and yet he is imminent. He is available and present. He sees. J.I. Packer, uh, in a book that he did in 1961 on evangelism, deals with this issue of uh, election and free will in his whole Treatise to treating about uh, winning people to Christ, and he calls it an antimony, where uh, what you have is you have these two truths as you mentioned, and they're both substantiated by truth, yet they're opposite. And the only way he says that you can embrace one above the other by excluding the other is to be untruthful with the yeah. text because they both are there. Absolutely. Um, this thing about eminence and, and transcendence, um, I think when you talk about eminence, um, would it be a proper to say, now, God, God just didn't put everything in motion and step back and let everything Correct. continue. He is involved. But his involvement hmm, may be confused into thinking that that, uh, that involvement is unrestricted or unlimited as we stand before him without Christ. When, when, I, when I look at, at our relationship to Him through Christ, that eminence becomes an active uh, thing in my life. It becomes available. Right. Now, eminence in the sense that He is involved in world, world, you know, world uh, issues and, and He is governing the world with an active participation. I can see that. But one could be misled by thinking that His eminence, uh, or I may be wrong on this, correct me, but but his eminence would be unconditional. Well, I think um, I, I said I wasn't going to make New Testament references because this is Old Testament theology and we want to stay true to that. The ultimate example, the ultimate manifestation of God's eminence is the incarnation. It's when God wow. chose to become physically, immediately present to us in the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, that was the, you know, all other 
uh, examples of God's imminence of his presence in the world is leading up to that ultimate example where God literally, physically uh, appeared in our presence, incarnate, uh -huh. incarnate, in the flesh, in the meat. Okay. Um, and so, yes, that's very much true. The idea, sometimes they talk about the, you know, God, the image of God as the great clockmaker who wound up creation and then, you know, so that it's running and then he went somewhere else. No, that's deism. That is not our faith. We believe that God is, and this is what Scripture's talking about, what all these are talking about, that God continues to be involved. He continues to be available. He is, he is the God who is currently and continually available to us. Now, we don't always understand how that works. You know, God, God hears all of our prayers. At the same time. At the same time. Yeah, <laughs> right. He's got a really good secretary. Um, he hears all of our prayers. He answers all of our prayers, as someone has said. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says not yet. We don't always understand the answer to his prayers, nor, nor certainly do we always like it. But the point of eminence is that God always hears, and God is always available for relationship with us. He, he has not started stuff and then decide to go on a cruise and is no longer available to us. Okay? That's, that's what we believe about eminence. All right, we believe also that God appears to us as the God who speaks. God makes himself known to us. Particularly, we talk about God revealing, the revelation of God. And that's what revelation means. It's the revealing. Revelation, reveal. The revealing or disclosing of truth or knowledge through communication with God, or more specifically, communication from God. The, um, this is a self-revealing. God chooses to make himself known to us. God has not been silent. A book that was very useful and important to me when I was a young Christian was uh, several of Francis Schaeffer's books. But one of Schaeffer's books is He is There and He is Not Silent. God is not a God who is not paying attention or is, is not available or hasn't said anything. God has gone to great lengths to make us aware of who he is and what he desires and how we're supposed to relate to him. In this, and especially then in the manifestation of his son, Jesus Christ. But um, in this, you get, when you talk about the revelation of God, you get into the principle of what's called accommodation. And that is the principle of accommodation is that God, being God, um, probably doesn't speak English. Good. But that's not, his, that's not his first language. I'm being facetious here. The point is that God has chosen to speak to human beings, to communicate with human beings in ways we can understand. Mm -hmm. um, John Chrysostom, the great uh, John of the Golden Mouth, the great preacher from uh, medieval times, he talked about the God who stoops, that God, being the infinite God, leans down close to us like you would an infant in a crib and make goo-goo noises. That's what God has done for us. Mm -hmm. He has accommodated His divine truth to us in ways that we can understand. That's what accommodation means. Um, he, God has made the effort to come down to us to communicate in our language, in, in particularly in our form, in the incarnation of Jesus, because we can't get to Him. Again, if you've heard me preach, you've heard me say over and over and over again, I believe the fundamental principle of the incarnation and salvation of Christ is that we were made for relationship with God. But because of our failing, the human race, that relationship was broken. We betrayed his faith. We betrayed his love. And so there is a chasm that exists between us and God. Well, no matter how good we think we are or how smart we think we are or how capable we think we are, it is not within our power to climb back up to God. In fact, one of the things that, that caused me to believe in Christianity, to believe in Jesus Christ, was the realization, as I studied different religions and different philosophies, that basically every religion in the world says, or philosophy for that matter, if you work and work and work and think and think and think and do good acts and do good things and try and try and try and try, you will climb up this ladder of human improvement until you get to the top, and then you look over, and you will have heaven, or nirvana, or enlightenment, or whatever the particular faith system you're part of says. 
there is one exception to that. Only one. Every other system is basically built upon an idea of self-improvement or the idea, well, you can't do anything, so you just lay around. You know, nothing's going to happen, uh, which is sort of Buddhism, you know. Uh, but the Christianity says you were made for relationship with the divine. You can't do it. So he did, because God is able to do it. Yeah. We cannot climb up to God. So he came down to us. That's accommodation. That's why the incarnation is the ultimate example of accommodation. But he also came down to us in appearing in the burning bush, in the call to Abraham. All of the calls, all of the covenants, all of the blessings, all of the provisions, all of that were forms of accommodation. Where the God of the universe, who doesn't have to do that, except that he's a good God, has made himself available to us in ways we can understand so that that relationship can be made whole again. The relationship that existed until we betrayed it. Okay? That's the fundamental story of Christianity. Um, the principle of accommodation. So God speaks. First, you know, Genesis 1. And God said, let there be light. God speaks. He he didn't just snap his fingers and it happened. God chooses to communicate, to speak, to reveal. Uh, Genesis 12, 1, the Lord had said to Abraham, Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. This is the first call to Abraham to start the people, the Hebrew people. That, this, this sentence is the start of the whole Hebrew people, the Jewish people on whom our traditions are built. We were grafted onto the vine of the Hebrew people. We were adopted into that household. And then Exodus 3, which we looked at before, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. In every case, God speaks in a way that we can understand it. He accommodates himself to, to communication that we can understand and benefit from. So he is a God who speaks. He reveals in ways we can understand People who say that God is a huge mystery, well, yes, it's being, being God, you're, I've been saying, there's ways in which we can't completely conceive of or articulate. But he's told us so much. He's told us almost more than we can take in or understand. And people who say, oh, God's a big mystery, I don't know about God. Well, then you are trying. Because he has revealed himself to us. Um, there's two kinds of ways in which God has revealed himself to us. The first one, the first kind of revelation, if you will, well, and again, revelation is the way God reveals himself. The first one is called general revelation. General revelation is God's witness to himself or about himself indirectly through history, the events of history, through nature, through human reason and conscience. God gave us minds. God gave us the ability to perceive history. God gave us the ability to perceive greatness in nature, the awesomeness of a mountain, the beauty of the clouds, whatever it is. Our experience of majesty and awesomeness in the things of the world, our ability to use our rationality to say, this, it makes sense to me that this, this is a story of God. Those are examples of general revelation. Psalm 19, 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. This is why, as I've said before, and Carolyn heard me say a thousand times, the greatest failing of humankind is not paying attention. Because if we were paying attention, Scripture says we would see the truth of God in the very things in this world. In Romans 1.19, Paul writes, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. And he's not talking about, he's talking about general revelation in the world Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, have been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. This is general revelation. We can see the awesomeness of God. You see the beauty of nature. You see the miraculous, you know, uh, the miraculous in the microscopic world and in all of that. And you go, boy, there's something behind this. There's got to be a God. If, if you have any humility, and if you're paying attention, those things will lead you to God. Indirectly. They will not lead you to a saving relationship with God, but they will point you to God. They'll lead you in that direction. Then, after general revelation, the other kind of revelation is special revelation. 
Whereas general revelation is an indirect witness of God to himself in history, rationality, and nature, special revelation is a direct revelation from God to us, especially in Scripture, and then also in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, <coughs> making himself known through that special revelation. A passage I use a lot, 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is God-breathed, meaning God made it happen. God inspired it in the people who wrote down these words. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God, I believe woman of God as well, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God has given us specific uh, understanding of him and his special revelation. Okay. So God is a God who speaks. He reveals himself both in the specifics of his message to the Hebrew people and to us as Christians, and also through his very creation. Any questions about that? You all do remember, you can ask questions. All right. The next way in which I believe God appears in the, in the, in the Old Testament is as a God who acts. This is one of the things that was confusing to me about this book, and Carolyn had to sort of talk me down on it last night. Um, the Anderson in this book, he starts writing, he's writing about all these different ideas that people have, all these different theories that people have presented. And he gets into deconstructionism. Basically, well, if you try to think of this in terms of actual history with, with a theological significance when you read the Old Testament, then you're, you're impressing something on it you shouldn't. It's just a story. Think of God as a character in a story. Well, Anderson finally comes back around, as Carolyn, because cautioned me that he comes back around and says, yeah, but you can't do that. God is more than just a character in a story. I had written in the margin before I got to that part, God is not a Shakespearean character. Okay? So, the fact is, contrary to what some of these people that Anderson is quoting in his book, um, God is a God who acts. He has done practical, real things in history that there were people there to see and to write about. This is not just a story. As powerful as stories can be, I've got nothing against story. There's a whole story theology, which I think has its place. But when we look at the history of God in the Old Testament, he is a God who acts. He acted in creation, or we wouldn't be here. He acted in call, calling of Abraham and others. He acted in covenant, the covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, the covenant with Noah, the covenant particularly with the Israel, Israelite people through Moses. He, in acts of redemption, like uh, ultimately the exodus and the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross for us, those are acts of redemption that God initiated. In acts of blessing, by providing for the Israelites in the desert, for instance, and provision, giving what is needed, those are acts, things God has done in the world for our sake. So he's a God who acts. Genesis 127, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. He acted to create. Isaiah 44, this is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, notice that re Redeemer is an Old Testament concept. It's not just Jesus as the Redeemer. The Old Testament is full of Redeemer language. Isaiah this is what the Lord says, Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord who has made all things, he acted, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Isaiah 45, I, you three quotes from Isaiah because Isaiah is great about first Redeemer. He uses the title the Holy One of Israel, which is very important, we'll talk about later on, not today, but later. Um, and then... These passages about God's acting. Isaiah 45, God speaking. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. Whenever I can't find something in my office, which is a horrible mess right now, I am assured by I will give you treasures in the darkness, riches stored in secret <laughs> places. Because I can't find anything right now. Um, uh, then Isaiah 45, 6 and 7, I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light, create the darkness, I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. He is a God who acts. He's not just a God who is a character in the story. Okay. 
then I believe we are presented with a God in the Old Testament who cares. The one that's probably most important to us. God is personal. God chooses to share his proper name with us. And, I should, and he shows his love. Now, I, I could have talked about this before. Um, particularly in ancient times, a name was a very special thing. I actually preached on this not too long ago, and I gave some of the names that celebrities give their kids these days, okay, which are just wacky. Now, clearly, people don't think names mean anything anymore. But in ancient times, if you knew the name of something, then you were considered to have a degree of power over it, especially in cultures that believed in magic. If you had a name, you could use it like a voodoo doll. You could use it to, to create spells. And most of these ancient cultures believed in magic. And yet, for all of the significant, and, and it was common, by the way, for people to have a secret name and a public name. The secret name was their real name. And you didn't just share that with anybody. Only your closest friends and closest family members. Only the people you absolutely trusted. And yet, in that context, God tells us his name, his proper name, as a sign of trust and of affection, of love. It's a very personal thing. And in that culture, it was huge. When Moses asked God, if they ask who sent me, what name do I give them? He was asking something much more personal than we would ever understand. Okay, now, first, as I say, part of God caring is he is personal. He is described not as the almighty great God, you know, the Holy One of Israel. He is called those things. But more often, he is called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The God who had a personal relationship with my family. It's very personal. Exodus 6, God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. And by my name, the Lord, I... By my name, the Lord, I did not make myself. Um, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. It, it bugs me a little bit. Um, you can see, I am the Lord up there, the capital letters. I had to change that for some reason. In my, I use computer um, Bible, PC study Bible, and I copy and paste. If you look at it on the screen, it's got the capitalized, you know, letters for that being Yahweh. But when I copy and paste it, for some reason, it always lowercases the, the rest of it. I don't know why that is. So I didn't change all of that, like by my name, the Lord. And I mentioned he shared his name with us. Exodus 34, this powerful uh, example following the Ten Commandments <laughs> and the establishment of the law. It says, then the Lord came down, this is with Moses on the mountain, came down in the cloud and stood there with him, with Moses, and proclaimed, proclaiming his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord. That's Yahweh, Yahweh. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The God who has shared his name and cares about us. And finally, to God who has shown us His love. Um, excuse me. Just yeah. right. would, would, would it be right to say when He did that, when He shared His name, it wasn't just to inform us; it was for us to participate. Yeah, actually, yeah. When He shared His name, He was inviting us to be intimate yeah. with Him. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just to. It you wasn't just so if we wrote Him a letter, we could say, "You're Yahweh." No, it was the sense in which He was making us family. He was making us an intimate of his when he gave his proper name. This is why, even with Abraham, <coughs> Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, God, it wasn't until the covenant with the Israelite people in Exodus 3 that God chose to share his personal name. It was an act of intimacy. And then he shows his love. From Isaiah 54, God says, Do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. This intimacy. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, I abandoned you. 
but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. He loves us. And yes, there are times which we, in which we deserve His judgment, and the Israelites certainly did. But He always came back. The story of the, of the Hebrew people is God loved them and blessed them and they betrayed his love and he punishes them and then he takes them back and loves them and they betray him and reject him and they receive judgment and then he takes them back over and over and over again. The God whose loving kindness is forever. God doesn't have to be like this. He's the God of the whole universe. He could start all over again if he wanted to. In fact, several times he's threatened to. He kind of did with Noah. The point is that that is the nature of a good God. That even though he is God and we are not, he stoops down and he accommodates and he loves us. He makes his name known to us. He is personal with us. He cares for us. This is the God of the Old Testament. The idea that the God of the Old Testament is this angry, judgmental, mean-spirited God, and then in the New Testament it's all sweetness and light and gentle Jesus is sweet and mild. No. People who say that have never bothered to read the Old Testament. They've never bothered to read passages like this. They've never bothered to see that over and over and over and over again, when God should have just destroyed the whole planet and started all over somewhere else, the other side of, you know, Jupiter, he didn't. He took his people back and loved them and forgave them and started again. That's not a God of anger and wrath and judgment. Yes, he's a God of judgment because people deserved it. But that judgment was for a little while. And then God's love steps in. Okay? So finally, this is how I see God appearing in the Old Testament. He is the God who is. He is uh, non-contingent. The eternal one, not dependent upon anything else, Yahweh, I am. He is the God who is wholly other, transcendent. He is also the God who sees and reveals, um, or sees and is close at the eminence. The God who speaks, who chooses to reveal himself in many ways to us. He is the God who acts through things like creation, call, covenant, redemption, blessing, and provision. He is the God who cares, who is personal, who is intimate in sharing his his personal name with us, and who is loving toward us, even when we don't deserve it. That's the God of the Old Testament. Questions about any of this? Hopefully I was a little able to, a little easier to hear than Anderson was to read. <laughs> uh, in the Old Testament, that God was so awesome, uh, scaring the living daylight, so yeah. yep. and just too much. Right. And it's nice to see this too. Mm -hmm. Well, well here, here, see, here's what you said earlier. He's immutable. He, he's unchangeable. Exactly. He didn't change. No. Nope. You know. God so has not changed. The same God that that we see through, and Christ is that exact representation of Him. So you cannot uh, uh, form an opinion that He was this ogre in the Old Testament. You no. know. No, God has not changed. He is the same. And, and he is an awesome God. He is a holy God. I didn't get in, you know, Anderson talks about holiness. He talks about the numinous, which is this, uh, uh, to be, the numinous is a, an awareness of the divine. Uh, now that the numinous presence of God, and he quotes a lot of that stuff. To me, a lot of that is wrapped up into the, his name Yahweh, you know, the, the Yahweh, the immutability of that, the uh, contingency of that. That is the awesomeness of God. And the transcendence as well, that he is far above us still has loved us enough to make himself available. Anything else? Well, you will be glad to know, right, and I don't have it on print, but it will be hard. The, the assignment for next week is to read from page 74 in Anderson to page 78. Oh, oh thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> The reason for that is because after page 78, Anderson gets into the covenants. As we said last week, Anderson follows Eichrode um, pretty much in terms of making covenant his primary theme and focus. We're going to talk about covenant, but I want to get to a couple of other theologies, particularly next week the theology of creation, before we get into covenant theology. 
And so I want you to read the part on the people of God, just four pages. And then there'll be more coming up later when we get into the covenant stuff because that's what he has a lot of. I won't make you read all of that. And if you want to get a head start, you can go ahead and do that. Any other questions or comments? You explained it a lot better than that book. <laughs> well, I didn't take exactly the same tact as him. And again, the book is introducing you to a wide range of theological approaches. It's good for you to have exposure to that. It's good for you to read that. My job is to help translate it in a way that you can you can apply it a little bit more directly to your previous experience. But it's good for you to stretch. It's good for you to read these words and look them up and, and have to figure this stuff out. Okay? You may not remember it, but it's good for you to have that experience. Thank you all. God bless you. We will see you very, very soon. And I'm going to be working to try to get that stuff up right away so that you can access these notes.